Thank you for coming, and um, it's lovely to see so many of you bright and early. Um, we're going to be joined by people over the day, people coming and going, but um, I think some of you will be long stayers. Um, so thanks so much for attending, and I'm pleased to see some familiar faces as well as some new faces as well, um, which is great to know that people are interested in this field and that we're really, I think, moving forward in a collegial manner, because that's always been our aim and our plan. Um, so there needs to be a bit of housekeeping before we go, um, so I just need to um, um, let you know about the exits which are back and also the toilets which are over here and it's flory policy that we do a welcome to country um, because of um, uh, the land that we're on and we acknowledge the elders, um, families and descendants of the Wurundjeri people who have been and who are custodians of these lands. We acknowledge that this treaty has never been ceded and that these um, places or these lands that we're on were actually um, places of celebration as well as initiation and renewal. Um, the, the, it's important also to know that there is coffee and there's coffee just outside, coffee and tea that's being provided during the day, um, which will be in the urns. It's probably going to be fairly dreadful. Sorry, Gabby, I'm sure that you did your best. Um, if you want good coffee, you can get one from Dax or there's lots of other um, cafes around here in the break. Um, but the, the coffee that's in the urns is free for you. Um, it also, just in terms of housekeeping, if you need um, an a certificate of attendance for today, then please let Gabby know. She can email you one. Um, they'll be available um, via email. We won't have them at the end of the day because people are coming and going for, the, for parts of the day. The other thing is that just to let this, just to remind the speakers and also the audience, because we'll often get in, uh, requests for slides at the end of the actual symposium. Um, a lot of uh, what's being presented today from my group and also uh, my uh, invited colleagues is actually not going to be published yet and so we, those, those data will not be provided. So all of the speakers will let us know what can and cannot be provided. So um, if, you get, if you ask for slides and there's not much in it, that's the reason why. These sessions are being recorded um, and again, uh, the, the speakers will have a chance to edit the recording to make sure that unpublished data or sensitive data is not actually uh, made available, but we will make all of these talks available on our Flory website as well. Um, if the speakers who are in sesh, each session could sit at the front um, so they can come, but that needs to only be if you're in that session, you don't have to come too far because these steps are easy to trip a little bit on, particularly with that light, which we need for the recording, but it really is quite bright. Um, and um, also if you haven't put your slides up for the speakers, please do so. Um, the other thing that's new about this particular um, uh, symposium today is that it's actually the first that we're doing with the Melbourne Dementia Research Centre, which is exciting for us. The last one we did prior to the initiation, and I've got quite a few of the MDRC people here, Ashley Porpery and Scott, um, who is around, where is he there? Um, and Ashley Bush will also be coming, um, so some of the deputy directors will also be presenting and coming. So it's exciting for us because it's co-branded. Of course, I didn't do the branding for the slides, but that's just one of Gabby's particular burdens that she has to bear with me. Emilio did, so he did the right thing. Thank you, Emilio. Um, and the last thing I just should mention is for the speakers who are up here, just for a number of reasons, these mics are for the room, this one's for the recording as is this one, so you will need to be mic'd or at least around. So we will be having questions at the end of each session um, rather than during the session, so it just to create sort of a flow. So make notes, if you've got a burning question in the break while we're setting up for the next speaker, then yell out, otherwise we'll have questions at the end. Because I think that sometimes we've tried to arrange the sessions so that people are talking around the same topics and might actually answer some of your questions as you go. Okay, so that's enough for housekeeping. This has gone blank. Okay, so um, I think it's okay, we'll see. So this is our second Vascular Neurodegeneration Symposium and the reason why we have been organising these is partly because of a dementia um, research team grant that we organised 
some years ago, 2015, we received it. And also because it seemed that there were a lot of people working in this field who weren't really coming together to have a conversation. And this cross-fertilisation is so critical. So we tried to maintain this discussion in a fairly agnostic and, co and collegial way. Um, I think it's really important that we have these discussions about what are the vascular contributions. And we thought that Emilio and I would just set the scene a little bit about why we're doing this research to allow the, the group, if you like, to be thinking about what are our questions, what are the questions that you're bringing as well. So one of the things that we, um, we, we had two broad themes and two, or two broad aims if you like, and two broad hypotheses in, for, for our um, DRTG, and they were essentially to look at vascular risk factors and to examine how we sort of established it was a given that, it, that this was happening, and that in itself was slightly controversial, but examine how vascular risk factors and the ischemic brain burden are leading to neurodegeneration, are leading to cognitive impairment, are leading to brain atrophy. Thank you, Stanley. And also to then develop methods, because one of the things is, I've got an imaging background from um, all of my research has been imaging, is that many of these methods have not been optimised to look at stroke populations. A lot of the methods have not been optimised to look at longitudinal data, and I think that that was really important for us to establish a way of actually in incorporating these measures and in fact using them potentially for, for clinical trials and in fact uh, we have just received funding or um, Vincent Tace, a uh, stroke researcher with me at the Austin, um, he was successful in a grant. We we're actually using a brain metric as an outcome measure. I think that that's really moving the field along. Our two broad hypotheses were that vascular brain injury and brain health actually determine late life cognition and I am a believer in that. Um, and that specific vascular mechanisms cause neurodegeneration. Um, there were th four or five really broad work plans for the DRTG. Um, we really wanted to understand an effect not only of the acute vascular injury, but also of the vascular brain burden arising from risk factors that were contributing to neurodegeneration, because one of the things that we found is that people with vascular risk factors already have atrophy, already have brain burden, already have cognitive impairment at the time of a stroke. We really wanted to be able to evaluate these degenerations both in animal and human models to have projects that mirrored each other so we could follow um, them longitudinally. The huge advantage of the animal uh, projects gave us that chance to probe the histology, which you'll hear uh, Vanessa and, and Jess and others talk about this afternoon. And to be able to evaluate these mechanisms, not just in stroke populations, but in people with other disease, such as diabetes and in atrial fibrillation, we're just starting a project, as well as in stroke and Alzheimer's disease. So we really, the plan was to develop, to, to, to be able to get this information, then to develop models for translation. Now I'm a clinician, so clearly I want there to be an outcome for this that I can actually use in the clinic. These, this was our little picture of our, our uh, major work plan. So it was our animal network depositions, um, our human, and then exploring mechanisms for trial development. So it was really the first two in marching along together, trying to mirror each other. And then the last one was really looking at how can we use these measures and take them back to trial development and to actually implementation in terms of treatment. Um, many of you know that uh, the investigators um, were myself and Jeff and Professor Hashinsky, who's uh, joining us here again today and is our keynote speaker this afternoon, um, as well as uh, John McNeil, who's a, a really world expert in public health and epidemiology. Um, Kath, Jess and Lachlan were all brought expertise in, in animal behaviour and stroke models and in stem cell um, potential treatments, which were, has been really critical in our trial design. Charlie DeCali is um, very interested in vascular disease and um, Alzheimer's disease and has a strong imaging background as well. And Leonard Chirilov, many of you would know, he's a, um, our world-class biostatistician. And Louise Burrell is an expert in hypertension as well as doing research in diabetes with our AIs as well. So we've got a fantastic group, and this has led to a fantastic bigger group, and these are, these are just some of the people involved in the projects at the moment. So this is just to set the scene. You'll hear from some of these people, and then you'll hear from people from around the world who are doing research that hopefully will actually inform us and our future studies. Thank you.
Okay, thanks, Amy, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Emilio Worden. I'm the manager of the, the Dementia Research Team grant. Uh, this morning, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of our uh, clinical projects, and I'm going to update you on our progress. We're not going to be presenting too much of our clinical data at this symposium. Um, it's really a chance for you guys and for other researchers in Victoria and Australia and around the world, actually, uh, to present their data. So the last symposium was all about us. This one is all about you guys. So our DRTG uh, program has two questions. The first question is, how does ischemic brain injury cause neurodegeneration and dementia? Second is, how can we prevent vascular cognitive decline? Now, as you'll see in a moment, we've developed a series of longitudinal studies involving populations with vascular risk factors and cerebrovascular disease, including ischemic stroke, type 2 diabetes, atrial fibrillation, in an attempt to uncover the mechanisms underlying vascular cognitive decline and to identify potential therapies. So the first project is the Cognition and Neocortical Volume After Stroke Study, or CANVAS. The aims of the study are twofold. First, to determine whether rates of brain volume loss and cognitive decline are faster after stroke. And second, to determine whether brain volume loss is associated with dementia. CANVAS is an observational longitudinal study. 135 stroke participants are recruited early after their events and complete assessments at several time points over five years. 40 age-matched healthy controls undergo the same testing. Now, the CANVAS study actually began in 2012. It was initially funded by an NHMRC project. Through the DRTG, we were able to add a five-year session to the study design and align CANVAS with similar studies that are being conducted all around Europe. These studies include DEMDAS in Germany, run by collaborators Martin Dishkins and Marco During, and Stroke Dem in France. So that's the first study. The second study is a Diabetes and Dementia, or D2 study. And apologies in advance for all of the acronyms that you're gonna to hear today. Prior research suggests that diabetes is a risk factor for dementia, but we don't know which patients will dement and which biomarkers predict cognitive decline. So the aim of D2 is to determine whether left ventricular hypertrophy, or LVH, affects brain structural integrity and cognition in type 2 diabetes. For those of you who don't know, LVH is characterized by thickening of the walls of the left ventricle of the heart. We believe that it may be a good biomarker because it's very common in diabetes and may be independently associated with cognitive decline. D2 is an observational longitudinal case control study. We aim to recruit about 168 patients with type 2 diabetes and we expect around half to have LVH. Participants are assessed at two time points at baseline and two years later. The third study is the post ischemic stroke cardiovascular exercise study, otherwise known as PICES. The aim of Pisces is to determine whether an eight-week aerobic exercise intervention can slow down brain volume loss and cognitive decline after stroke. Pisces is a phase 2b randomised control trial. We'll recruit 100 stroke participants within two months in their events and randomise each one to one of two exercise groups, an aerobic or strength training exercise group or a balanced stretching group. Participants complete a neuropsychological examination, an MRI scan and fitness test at three time points at two, four and 12 months post-stroke in between the two and four months post-stroke sessions, will undergo, they'll undergo the eight-week exercise program. This is where they need to attend three by one hour sessions each week with a trained exercise physiologist or a physiotherapist. The final study is the SPRI af study, the aspirin in reducing events in the elderly atrial fibrillation study. The SPRI study is led by, in Australia by John McNeil, a chief investigator on the DRTG. ESPRI is one of the largest intervention studies in the world, involving approximately 20,000 healthy people, most of which in Australia, some in the US, aged over seven years at the time of recruitment. Participants are randomised to take either a low-dose uh, low aspirin or placebo for about five years. The aim of the study was to determine whether daily low-dose aspirin could prevent or delay the onset of age-related illnesses, for example, cardiovascular disease and dementia. Now, our goal in the DRTG is to use existing cognitive and MRI data collected in the spree to examine two things. The first are the effects of incident atrial fibrillation on cognition and brain volume, and, the effect, and two, the effect of anticoagulation treatment post-AF diagnosis on cognitive and brain volumetric trajectories. We're interested in atrial fibrillation because it's a major risk factor for stroke and possibly dementia, but few studies have actually characterised cognitive and brain volumetric changes over time in AF patients. We expect around 1,000 spree participants to have developed AF during the five-year study. 
We first plan to conduct a scoping study via the SPREE database to determine how many of these participants have cognitive and MRI data after, before and after an AF diagnosis. If the sample size is ins insufficient, we'll collect additional data ourselves. So we'll ask about 200 participants, 100 of which have um, AF, 100 controls, to undergo detailed assessments at one time point. Now this is a snapshot of the DRTG clinical project methods, and I want to highlight three points from this slide. First, as you can see there, we're collecting quite a bit of data, and mind you, this is not all of it. Uh, every study collects detailed demographic, medical data, cognitive imaging, physical activity and sleep data. We're also collecting blood samples for participants at every time point for APOE genotyping and also to examine markers of neurodegeneration. Second, there's a great deal of overlap in the data that we collect across our projects. This means that we're better able to compare findings across our different cohorts. And third, we're collecting world-class imaging data. We have a susceptibility weighted, weighted imaging sequence in our studies, so we can examine the relationships between iron deposition, brain volume and cognition. We have an arterial spin labelling sequence in Pisces, so we can examine cerebral blood flow. We amyloid, uh, image amyloid in our stroke participants in Canvas, and we're also imaging amyloid in tau in our type 2 diabetes patients. So this really is a unique set of methods, and it's quite novel in cerebrovascular disease populations. And of course, we'll ensure that any additional data collected as part of the spre AF study uh, is consistent with our projects. If you want more information about the uh, project methods, I'll direct you to our published protocols for Canvas, D2 and Pisces here. And also the spre study here. Now, this is a timeline of the DRTG uh, program. Now, the Canvas study down the bottom there laid the foundation for the DRTG application. It began in 2012 and the three year review sessions were completed in August 2018. We received five years of funding for the DRTG late in 2015. D2 recruitment uh, began in mid 2016 and we expect the study to be completed uh, by the end of 2022. The Canvas five year study will be completed by the end of 2020 and we're well, well on track. The Pisces study began in 2017 and it's on track to be completed by the end of 2022. Now the scoping study of ISPRI AF will begin shortly and will be completed by June this year. Uh, additional data collection, if required, will likely begin in August and last until the end of next year. Now here's an update on the progress of each study. Recruitment for Canvas ended in July 2015. Our primary sites of recruitment were Austin Health, Fox Hill Hospital and Royal Melbourne Hospital. Our final numbers to the baseline to three-year cohort are presented here. You can see that 83 stroke participants completed assessments within six weeks of their events, 126 completed assessments at three months, and 101 completed their three-year review sessions. We expect about 108 with the 20% attrition rate, so we're, we've done quite well. 36% of these participants at three years in the stroke group completed an amyloid PET scan. You can see that our attrition is quite low at around 13% if you disregard the participants that died after their stroke. And really that's a testament to the uh, Canvas team and especially Laura Bird. To date, 38 stroke participants and 13 controls have completed their five year assessments. And we expect around 85 to 90 uh, stroke participants and around 35 controls to complete the five year time point. Now to D2, We're more than halfway through recruitment for the D2 study. Uh, to date, our primary sources of recruitment have been Austin Health and private clinics uh, run by study investigators and collaborators, in particular, Associate Professor Aletha Kinsey. A big shout out to her for all the patients she's referred to us. We recently extended recruitment to St Vincent's Hospital to uh, quicken the process and ensure that recruitment ends at the end of this year. 85 participants have completed their baseline assessments and six have completed their follow-ups, and only one participant has withdrawn to date. And again, that's a testament to the D2 crew. Now Pisces, we're a quarter of the way through recruitment for this study. Uh, we're currently uh, recruiting participants from Austin Health, but we plan to extend recruitment to Eastern Health uh, in April and possibly Western Health later this year. Uh, 27 participants have completed their baseline sessions, 25 have completed the eight week intervention um, and the four month review session, and 12 have completed their one year review uh, session. At this stage, we've only had three uh, adverse events and all have been relatively minor. So the exercise program appears to be feasible. It appears to be safe and well tolerated by participants. And the qualitative feedback really is that they enjoy the program and they enjoy spending time with our uh, exercise physiologists and physiotherapists. So good feedback from participants. The final study, Esprit AF. 
Our expression of interest um, has been approved to begin the scoping study, so that will start shortly, probably March. Additional data collection, if required, will take place between August this year and December next year. We are almost there. Probably the most over, overused me in the internet, but we are almost there. We have to keep going. By the next symposium, I'm hoping that we can present some more data um, on our projects, especially our clinical projects. Before I wrap up, our time's almost up. I wanted to thank all of the people involved in the DRTG clinical uh, projects. There's a lot of people there, um, and I've probably missed a few. Um, I wanted to thank um, all the people involved, the, the collaborators, the uh, funders for their support. And also, I just wanted to shout out, to, uh, have a shout out to a couple of people here. Firstly, to our participants in all of our clinical projects. Um, they've generously contributed their time to our studies, and our research wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible without them. Um, here's a classic example. This is um, Ian Pearson. Over here. He's a Canvas study participant who recently completed his five-year review. This is Ian uh, with Amy Brockman at the most recent uh, Flory Public Lecture Series, the Healthy Brain Aging uh, Lecture Series. And it looks like Amy's yelling at Ian here for not doing um, enough exercise. That's what it seems like. Um, I also want to thank, of course, our fearless leader, Amy Brockman, uh, for everything she's done for our project and our team. Um, I want to thank all of the um, postdoctoral researchers, the research assistant, the PhD students who collect data every day for us and process our data. And finally, I want to thank um, Gabrielle Jean, a liaison manager, uh, who not only did a great job organising this symposium, but others in the past, and who does a great job organising us every day. So thank you very much for your uh, time. Enjoy the symposium. We hope you have a great day. Thank you.